Meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, mein Name ist Hafsa Al-Bohamuchi und ich bin wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiterin hier in der W. Michael Blumenthal Akademie des Jüdischen Museums Berlin. Ich begrüße Sie recht herzlich zu unserer heutigen Veranstaltung zum Thema Menschenrechtsabkommen und ihre Rezeption. Nach einer philosophischen und theologischen Einführung in das Thema Menschenrechte aus jüdischer und islamischer Perspektive im November letzten Jahres befassen wir uns heute etwas konkreter mit der Umsetzung von Menschenrechten und dem Umgang mit Abkommen innerhalb jüdischer und muslimischer Traditionen und entsprechender aktueller Diskurse. Die Beschäftigung mit aktuellen Themen, die beide Religionen beschäftigen, ist unter anderem durch das Format der Ringvorlesung zu einem festen Bestandteil unseres jüdisch-islamischen Forums geworden. Mit dem Forum will die Akademie des Jüdischen Museums Berlin das Verhältnis von Judentum und Islam beleuchten und eine Plattform für die Auseinandersetzung mit religionsphilosophischen und religionspraktischen Fragen schaffen. Wichtig ist uns dabei nicht nur, uns an Fragestellungen abzuarbeiten, die von außen an Juden und Muslimen herangetragen werden, sondern auch solche Fragen aufzugreifen, die innerhalb der Religionsgemeinschaften selbst heiß diskutiert werden. Und da zählen Menschenrechtsthemen wie die Fragen der Religionskritik, des Religionswechsels oder einer geschlechtergerechten Lesart religiöser Quellen und Traditionen zweifelsohne dazu. Wir freuen uns sehr über Ihr reges Interesse und Ihr Erscheinen und es ist uns eine außerordentliche Freude, dass wir für den heutigen Abend mit Professor Galczynski und Professor Mashoud Baderin zwei so hochkarätige Experten zum Thema Menschenrechte zusammenbringen konnten. Auch Ihnen beiden ein herzliches Willkommen. Beide Referenten werden Ihnen gleich von Dr. Nahed Samur näher vorgestellt, die sie als Moderatorin durch den heutigen Abend führen wird. Sie ist Rechts- und Islamwissenschaftlerin und arbeitet zu einer islamischen Geschichte des Völkerrechts. Seit 2015 ist sie Junior Faculty an der Harvard Law School, Institute for Global Law and Policy and Postdoc Researcher am Lichtenberg Kolleg The Göttingen Institute for Advanced Study. In ihrer Habilitation arbeitet sie zum Religionsverfassungsrecht. Bevor ich Nahed Samur das Wort übergebe, möchte ich Sie noch einmal darauf hinweisen, dass die heutige Veranstaltung gleich auf Englisch stattfindet und Sie sich hier an der Seite bei Bedarf Kopfhörer für die Übersetzung nehmen können. Nun wünsche ich uns allen einen anregenden Abend. Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be moderating tonight's lecture on human rights treaties and how they are received by Jewish and Muslim actors. I'm delighted because it gives us the opportunity to think about the complex relationship between rights and obligations, between the individual, the collective, nation state, and international treaties. I know that one main conventional question that always comes to mind is how to reconcile human rights and religion. I would argue, uh, or, and I would argue that this question is underestimating the resilient nature of religion to dynamically deal with today's realities. But this question is, in fact, an important reminder to push harder for religious concepts of equality that can be found in any religious texts. So yes, the challenge remains how one can elaborate on a human rights-friendly reading of religion or a religion-friendly reading of human rights. In fact, these questions anticipate productive tensions, as of course there is no religious or legal text free of hierarchies. And so I take tonight's event as an invitation to discover with you the vast potential for translation work between the different normative regimes of the international, the national, and the religious. But do let me confess that for those committed to both human rights and religious discourses, there is reason to be troubled when thinking about both. We live in an age in which most of the human rights treaties, and there are nine core treaties, have been ratified by the vast majority of countries in the world. Yet it seems that the human rights agenda has fallen on hard time. It seems that more human rights, or at least more human rights discourse, does not necessarily lead to more emancipation, at least not for most on this globe. 
It is true that human rights organizations, very often referencing human rights treaties that their governments have signed and ratified, some of these organizations working with and others without reference to religion or to God, they are more numerous, have more resources, and operate in more countries than ever before. No one can or should deny that these groups continue to play an important and valuable role in stopping violations or advancing human rights policies in many countries. The work, the work of developing and even more importantly defending human rights norms and documenting violation will remain important. It is impossible though to look at what is happening in many places and deny that human rights have been losing ground. It is impossible to deny that the idea of human rights is in crisis. I'm bringing up this human rights skepticism that you can find in a lot of scholarly debates, just to allow for a bigger picture of human rights on a global level. And of course, to remind ourselves that human rights and religion always require us to bring in power relations. And it is within these power relations, legitimized by religion or else, that we think of the dark or the emancipatory side of human rights, as well as the dark or emancipatory side of religion. Now, I am delighted that tonight's guests are no strangers to any of these dilemmas and have been thinking hard over the last years to expose gaps and potentials in the human rights and religion discourse. Both speakers will talk to us both from inside their religious traditions as well as with the experience of long and intense dedication to human rights work. As the first to guide us through this web of questions, I'm delighted and honored to introduce Professor Michael Gal Galczynski, who is professor at George State University College of Arts and Sciences. He writes on human rights literature, international human rights, 19th century British literature, and Jewish studies. His most recent book, the Modes of Human Rights Literature Towards a Culture Without Borders investigates the four major modes of human rights writing, protest, testimony, lament, and laughter. His study of Jewish human rights activism after World War II, Jews and Human Rights, Dancing at Three Weddings, explores Jews' initial enthusiasm for the growing international human rights regime in the wake of the Holocaust but then the waning of their support starting in the late 1960s as the human rights discourse began to be used to delegitimize Israel. He uh, is addressing um, many human rights uh, questions in counterterrorism, genocide prevention, and international law respecting the West Bank settlements and various aspects of human rights cultures uh, in a variety of articles that have appeared in the Human Rights Re Review, the Journal of Human Rights, International Studies Perspectives, etc., And he is affiliated to a variety of human rights and democracy uh, institutions, such as uh, the one at Georgia State University, and he's fellow at the Yale University Center for Cultural Sociology. I'm very happy to have Professor Galczynski coming to us and talking to us, so please, Professor Galczynski, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nahed. And I, I know that both Mashud and I are uh, very happy to be here tonight. It's such a terrific crowd, and thank you for coming out. Um, and we hope to make this as much of a conversation as we can. Uh, and so you're talking about the translation work that religious human human rights activists have to do, and that's as good a place as any for us to start. It, when it comes to Jews, uh, there's a very intricate amount of translation work that needs to happen all the time. I call it uh, dancing at three weddings. So dancing at the wedding of international human rights, dancing at the wedding of domestic civil rights or citizenship rights, and dancing at the wedding, if you're a diaspora Jew, of Jewish nationalism, Jewish rights in a national state. And when you try to balance those three political commitments as a modern Jewish activist, it sometimes gets pretty complicated. Uh, sometimes all those three commitments 
seem to work together very well. So Jews in the 1950s in the United States, for example, tended to see 1948 as a moment of twin births. The twin births of 1948 were the State of Israel and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And Jews in the 50s in the United States tended to see both the commitment to human rights and the commitment to Israel as running in the same direction. They were both responses to the Holocaust. They were both responses to never again. They were both about protecting Jews and other disfavored minorities, whether ethnic or religious. But in my book, what I discovered was that Jews' uh, enthusiasm for the international human rights regime began to wane, um, as was already said, in the 1960s and 70s, due to a persistent tendency at the United Nations to not only criticize Israel for its human rights violations, but to use uh, Israel's violations as a pretext to delegitimize it as a state. Uh, many Jews began to uh, perceive that this was a new form of anti-Semitism, which was bent on um, uh, treating Israel and Jews um, alone among the peoples of the world as though they did not have the right to self-determination. So on the one hand, Jews were human rights activists, especially in the United States, largely liberal, largely secular, and they worked for human rights organizations like the American Jewish Committee and the World Jewish Congress and B'nai B'rith. Uh, and those were human rights organizations. All three of those organizations uh, started out in, in response to pogroms or other um, violations of Jews' rights. And they were bent on human rights. But as Israel began to be more criticized in the international arena, uh, maintaining that stance became more and more difficult. And I'm going to give you a few examples of what I mean. But first, before I do that, let me just mention something recent, some recent events that you will have noticed, and that really put this dilemma in stark perspective. So you've been hearing um, about uh, President Trump's announcement that the United States is moving its embassy to Jerusalem and declaring Jerusalem the capital of Israel. That wasn't really a, a big surprise to anybody, um, but the big surprise was that President Trump did not carve out East Jerusalem as the future capital of the state of Palestine. So this sent a message to hardliners in Israel that we're going to start thinking about a one-state solution in Israel. Um, and so that, if you're interested in human rights, and for Jews who are interested in human rights, that begins to raise serious questions like, OK, if the West Bank now becomes de facto a part of Israel, what happens to the rights of the three million Palestinians who are in the West Bank and now become Israelis? Do they have the same laws, the same courts as Israeli Jews, as Israeli Arabs? Or is there a separate set of laws and courts that are carved out for them? So this becomes really a headache for people who are of a human rights mindset in Israel and out of Israel. Um, and you could see the Israeli government sort of preparing the table for this kind of dilemma in its recent decision to blacklist organizations from around the world, largely Jewish organizations, but not only Jewish organizations, who had supported the BDS movement, the Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement, which is boycotting the production of uh, the sale of products uh, made in the West Bank. So, you know, these are very hard issues for Jews who love human rights and Jews who love Israel. They have to dance at both of those weddings.
My talk today is called Jewish Approaches to Human Rights, and uh, it's in the plural, Approaches to Human Rights. When we talk about Jewish human rights activism, we have to distinguish between uh, approaches to human rights adopted by Israeli Jews and those adopted by Jews in the diaspora. They take distinctly different approaches. We have to distinguish between approaches taken by Ashkenazim, Sephardim, and Mizrahim in Israel. We have to distinguish between approaches taken by secular liberal Jews and religious Jews. Uh, and I, I like to say that there were 12 tribes of Israelites in the Torah, and there are at least 12 tribes of Jews operating in response to human rights right now. A lot of the fissures that take place in an intracommunal sense between Jews and among Jews have to do with where you stand on the question of whether Israel should be, as its basic law, its constitution says, a Jewish and democratic state. Which of those two uh, adjectives do you prioritize, the Jewish part or the democratic part? So the, the, this has become uh, fodder for a lot of intracommunal debate, but I wanna back up now Having set that table, we'll come back to that at the end. I, wa I want to back up and give you a little bit of the history of uh, hu how human rights history and Jewish history are inextricably intertwined, right from the get-go. Jews, even before the advent of the modern human rights movement after World War II, Jews were all about what wasn't called human rights then, but what was called citizenship rights or civil rights. In the 19th century, uh, ever since uh, the French Revolution and its Declaration of the Rights of Man, Jews petitioned their home countries to allow Jews to have the full rights of citizens, to move, in essence, from a legal perspective, from aliens to citizens. And we know that... Um, this went on throughout the 19th century, culminating with the complete failure uh, of human rights or, or civil rights for Jews in France, uh, which was symbolized by the Dreyfus Affair. Jews continued to work for human rights into the 20th century. First, uh, uh, the Committee of Jewish Delegates began to work at the formation of the League of Nations to put together something called the Minorities Treaties. And they were largely influential on the governments of the world in passing these Minorities Treaties that would protect for the first time religious and ethnic minorities in Eastern Europe from discrimination, which Jews were suffering through pogroms at the time. After the League of Nations fell, uh, and the Holocaust happened, well then it became clear to everybody that there needed to be, and this was clearly stated in the Nuremberg Tribunal, there needed to be special laws and treaties developed to protect the disfavored uh, minorities, ethnic, religious, linguistic of the world. And first and foremost, Jews who had suffered most in the Holocaust. So it was Jews who went to the San Francisco Conference in 1945 where the powers were uh, gathering together to form the United Nations. It was Jews led by Joseph Proskauer of the American Jewish Committee who argued that human rights ought to be um, one of the three pillars of the United Nations Charter. And it was Jews who, uh, led by non-governmental organizations like the American Jewish Committee, the World Jewish Congress, um, and some others, who undertook the important work of standard setting in the decades that followed that ended up issuing in those nine human rights treaties we were hearing about. So Jews got very interested in issues of particular concern to them, issues that had to do with um, religious freedom, freedom of movement, the plight of stateless people, uh, uh, the rights of the child, 
And in all of these areas, Jews made signal contributions and in many others. Special mention needs to be made of Raphael Lemkin, who was a Polish Jew and an international lawyer who uh, came up with the term genocide in the 1930s and then spent the next decade trying to get anybody to listen to him to, to define the crime and to name it as a crime in an international treaty. And it was Lemkin who sort of operated as a one-man NGO, writing in six different languages to governments around the world, gathering support, who finally uh, was able to have that signal achievement of getting the UN Genocide Convention passed in 1949. Special mention needs to be made of René Cassin, who was the head of the Alliance Israelite Universelle uh, before becoming one of the drafters of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, Cassin was an interesting fellow because he had what a, a, a kind of counterintuitive idea of the role that Judaism and Jews could play in forming human rights. There were a lot of people back then and since who claimed that Judaism was sort of a, had a special role to play in the formation of, of human rights. You could find, many people argued that you could find most of the modern human rights that we consider rights in the Torah. So uh, people like Chaim Cohen, an Israeli Supreme Court justice, who, said, who pointed to the Torah's inscription that says, um, uh, do not oppress the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. And he, he pointed out that this is, the, uh, this is the basis for certain kinds of immigration law. Uh, that ends up in the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. He said, listen to what the prophet Amos says, justice, justice shall you pursue. This is a universalist injunction to pursue justice. And this is the basis for human rights. He pointed to the Jewish concept uh, in Genesis of B'Tselem Elohim, uh, the idea that every human being is made in the image of God as the basis for the UN Universal Declaration uh, treating each human being as equal in dignity and rights. And so uh, Chaim Cohen thought that Judaism was the source from which human rights sprang. René Cassin, the drafter of the UN Universal De Declaration of Human Rights, disagreed. He said no. Uh, the Torah doesn't talk about rights. It doesn't have a rights concept. The Torah talks about duties. It talks about commandments, not rights. But Chaim Cohen wrote back to René Cassin and he said, guess what? Every duty implies a right. If I have a duty not to kill you, then you have the right to demand that I not kill you. Their duties and rights are complementary. They're flip sides of the same thing. Now, they had this disagreement, but we can think about other ways in which the Torah maybe does or doesn't uh, become a great source for modern human rights injunctions. Let's think for a second about the, um, the book of Joshua, in which God commands Joshua to kill 31 Canaanite kings with all their people and possessions, to put them to the sword. Now that particular scripture could not be the source of the UN Genocide Convention. We could think about the, the Noachide laws, the seven universalist laws in Genesis uh, that apply to everybody Israelite and non-Israelite alike, that could be a source. But we could also think about those uh, injunctions that when you go to war, if you're an Israelite, you have to tear down all the altars of the worshipers of Baal who are in your path. 
That could not be the source of the UN's uh, right to international religious freedom. The point is that Torah, like all religious traditions, is an incredibly complex uh, text that has many different strains in it. It was developed over many hundreds, even thousands of years, along with its commentaries. And Torah does not speak with one voice. You will hear people say, the essence of Judaism is human rights. But when you think of Torah as a stratified and complex uh, set of documents and ideas, you get back to that 12 tribes idea. There are lots of Jews. You know, what is that joke? Uh, ask, ask one Jew, get 10 opinions. And uh, this, is, this is one of those cases. So the point is that along with every theological corpus out there, including Islam, I assume, maybe we'll hear differently, um, Judaism is comprised of different layers. And Jewish activists have sometimes had to grapple with the fact that not all of their religious traditional material can be assimilated comfortably to a modern human rights perspective. In their encounter with human rights, Jews have had to begin by selecting a usable past. And so that means being really intent, intentional about going to the, to the past, going to the tradition and saying, what here is going to help me in my effort to uh, propose, support human rights? So this is tricky, but it's even trickier than I'm making it sound because there's not just Jewish law, Jewish traditional religious law that Jews have to deal with when they're trying to come up with a human rights program in the modern world. But there's also international law. And then if you're Israeli, there's Israeli law. So there's this conflict of laws. And the laws don't always speak with one voice. I'll give you some examples of, of that in a little bit. Some activists have tried to make a synthesis of the different sources of law in order to support their human rights activism. Arik Asherman, who was the head of uh, the Israeli human rights organization, Rabbis for Human Rights, once said that we have to merge the Torah of international law with the Torah of Jewish law. We have to merge the Torah of international law with the Torah of Jewish law. Torah meaning teaching, suggesting that both Torahs are sources of truth. All right, let's talk about the four types of Jewish human rights activism that have emerged since World War II. And I'll go through these pretty quickly, but we can spend some more time on them in the discussion if we like. So after World War II, Jews began making important contributions to the establishment of human rights pr principles, not just to protect Jews in Europe, but other minority groups. Um, so I've already talked about the role that Jews have played in standard setting. And just to give you a few more examples, the World Jewish Congress uh, came up with the language on hate speech that was incorporated into the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Uh, the International Council of Jewish Women wrote the first draft of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, much of which was summarily incorporated by the United Nations. Sidney Liskovsky of the American Jewish Committee wrote the International Declaration on Religious Freedom. Uh, Jews contributed mightily behind the scenes and through their submissions to UN human rights bodies, to uh, the monitoring of human rights, uh, and to standard setting. They built coalitions, the Save Darfur Coalition, 
which uh, was the major U.S. organization trying to stop the genocide in Darfur, was led by Ruth Messenger, who was the head of the American Jewish World Service, and who said often and often that her activism on behalf of the Darfuris was driven by her by the biblical injunction not to stand idly by in the face of oppression. Elie Wiesel, we know, began the Committee on Conscience of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, which was the first organization in the United States to offer an early warning of genocides in progress. So that, that's that first group. It's com really committed to making human rights actually work in the world by contributing to standard setting, monitoring, advocacy, and coalition building. The second group were those NGOs that were denominational in character. Groups like the International Council of, of Jewish Women originally began um, uh, as an Orthodox or organization trying to argue for women's rights within Jewish Orthodoxy. The Agudas Israel World Organization started as an advocacy group for Eastern Orthodox uh, European Jews. Um, the World Union of Progressive Judaism, the uh, political arm of the reform movement, is another example. So that was another one. Then you could think about NGOs that weren't really interested in the international governance system the way the ones I was just talking about were, but they were really interested in particular issues in their home country or in another country, but they were sort of issue specific and they were focused on one country. Really good examples that come to mind are the groups of uh, Jews who got together to advocate for uh, the right to emigrate of Soviet Jews. And you'll remember the Soviet Jews were systematically denied exit visas uh, for many years, and um, groups like the uh, National Council of Soviet Jewry and the Union of Councils of Soviet Jews argued very systematically and impressively for their right to emigrate. Uh, groups like the Association of Ethiopian Jewry uh, single-handedly prodded the state of Israel to airlift the 14,000 Ethiopian Jews out of Ethiopia and into Israel in May 1991. So the, the, the fourth group, the last group I'm going to talk about of NGOs consists of those that were established in Israel beginning in the mid-1970s in reaction against the 1967 occupation of the West Bank. Now, they started with a group called the 21st year of the occupation. Another early group was the Four Mothers, who were, just as the name sounds like, Four Mothers, who were super mad because their sons had been killed in Lebanon. And um, they formed that group. Most of the early groups that formed in the 70s didn't last for a number of reasons. But the ones that did last include the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, which is still today the largest, most well-funded, and most credible of the uh, human rights groups operating inside the Green Line. And then there was B'Tselem. And you notice, remember I said B'Tselem Elohim is that notion of everyone being made in the image of God. B'Tselem took its name from that, and it works in the occupied territories. Another wave, uh, and, and, and they were joined by others with very specific issues, uh, physicians against torture in Israel, um, the, committee on, the International Committee on, Against House Demolitions in Israel, um, and, and that was the first real wave of Israeli human rights organizations. The second wave formed uh, in the wake of the failure of the Oslo Peace Accords of the late 1990s, and the, second ons the, the onset of the Second Intifada, which occurred in 2000 to 2005. 
So these groups included Machsom Watch, meaning Checkpoint Watch, which was founded in 2001 as a women's organization monitoring treatment of Palestinians at checkpoints in the West Bank. They got their start because of a couple of cases of Palestinian women who couldn't get through the checkpoints and ended up having their babies in their cars. In 2004, a group of Jews and Arabs formed Tayush, Arabic for Life in Common, as an anti-racist organization. Gisha, meaning access, focuses on Palestinians' freedom of movement, and Yeshdin, meaning there is judgment, works on a broad range of issues in the territories. These days, though, most of these groups are running on life support. They don't have very much support, if any, in the state of Israel. Um, the Israeli government treats them as, uh, often as enemies of the state. And, um, and so, like many human rights groups around the world, these, these groups have a rough go of it. Uh, but they have had some successes, which I talk about in my book. Chief, chief among them was uh, convincing the Israeli Supreme Court to ban torture in a famous decision uh, from the 1990s. Um, finally, I just want to talk about the difference between diaspora approaches and, uh, well, I want to talk about the difference between diaspora approaches and Israeli approaches to human rights and then talk a little bit about the difficulties that Israel has faced when it tries to be a, a regular member of the international community. So first, Israel and diaspora Jews, it's important to know, don't always agree on the proper approach to a particular rights issue. So a good example of that is what happened in, uh, in the case of Soviet Jews' immigration rights. Um, Israeli, uh, Jews in, in the diaspora, which in those days mostly meant Jews in the United States, um, working in non-governmental organizations. Jews in the diaspora felt really strongly that Soviet Jews' emigration rights was an issue of international human rights. It was a universal issue. Everybody should have the right to emigrate wherever they want. That's what it says in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that everybody has the freedom of, of movement. But is the Israeli government took a different stance. It said every Jew in, in the Soviet Union should have the right to emigrate to Israel. In other words, Israel's response came from a national, nationalist perspective that was based on a kind of uh, vision of Israel as the central point of the ingathering of the exiles. Diaspora Jews, coming from a secular liberal human rights perspective, saw it differently. Jews should be, like anybody else, able to go wherever they wanted to go. Um, In general, it's probably best to think of modern Jewish politics as a coalition of organizations that sometimes work together, sometimes work at odds, sometimes have formal agreements, sometimes have informal agreements. They're a, a, a collection of global Jewish political communities. So, finally, uh, a word needs to be said about the international human rights system and Israel. Although, as I said at the beginning of the post-1945 period, diaspora Jewish activists were really enthusiastic about human rights, their enthusiasm waned primarily because many members of the new UN majority, which included the communist bloc, Arab states, and newly independent African and Asian states, began to use the human rights system not just to criticize Israel for particular violations, but to ostracize it from the community of nations. So it's not a surprise that Israel violates human rights. Every, every state violates human rights. The European Court of Human Rights found Finland recently in violation of human rights. 
Every state violates human rights. That's something that states do. And in the case of Israel, uh, it's in such a, 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 it has been for so long since its independence in such a uh, tight political and military situation that it's not a surprise that we're going to find human rights there. The question is, what does the international community do uh, in, when that happens? The General Assembly's uh, resolution of 1975 equating Zionism with racism initiated decades of condemnations of Israeli rights pra practices by various UN bodies. The Commission on Human Rights, which is now the Human Rights Council, uh, adopted more resolutions condemning Israel than it did for any other state, including states practicing genocide. It really became apparent that when, when Sudan took the chair of the Commission on Human Rights at the very moment that it was engaging in a genocide. Uh, the General Assembly entertained two resolutions to expel Israel from the organization. And uh, until May of 2000, Israel was the only country in the world except for apartheid South Africa, which was not allowed to participate in any of the UN's regional groups, which meant that it couldn't participate on committees, couldn't make submissions, couldn't really have an impact on the body. Israel was the subject of two emergency special sessions of the General Assembly, a rarely invoked forum that wasn't used in cases of genocide. And until uh, 2006, when the International Committee of the Red Cross changed its rules, Israel's National Emergency Medical and Disaster Aid Service, Magen David Adon, meaning Red Star of David, was denied affiliate status. Such singling out was supposed to end when the Human Rights Commission was retooled as the Human Rights Council in 2005. But uh, alas for Israel, the council often seems to be using sour old wine in a new bottle. So uh, Jewish human rights activists have had an incredibly complicated dance to dance in relation to this reality of persistent uh, anti-Zionism at the United Nations. And I just want to give you, I'll, I'll end with this one example that I think tells the story probably better than anyone that I know of right now. In the 1970s, right at the time when the UN General Assembly was passing the Zionism Equals Racism Resolution, uh, Amnesty International, the Sunday Review of the London Times, and a number of other uh, places began publishing what looked like verified evidence of Israeli human rights violations vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians. So the American Jewish Committee, which is based in New York, was led by Sidney Liskovsky and a number of other human rights activists. These people were human rights activists. They'd been involved in human rights for a really long time. But they looked at these, at the Zionism equals racism resolution. They looked at, at some of these other allegations that were coming forth, and they kind of freaked out behind the scenes. They talked to each other confidentially, and, and we have some letters that preserve this discussion. Um, about, well, what should we do about it? Let's say these Israeli allegations are true. What should we do about it? Will calling Israel on the carpet for its violations simply give its enemies more fodder against it? Will we be in the diaspora? Will we be thought of as Israel's enemies? They really wrung their hands and they didn't know what to do about it. There was a lot of ambivalence because they loved Israel, they supported Israel, they thought Jews had the right to self-determination, and they were human rights activists. So here's what they did, what the American Jewish Committee did in the 1970s. Publicly, they published a book which defended Israel against its critics. Privately, they set out to meet with a bunch of non-governmental Israelis to found the first human rights organization in Israel. 
the Association for Civil Rights in Israel. And so they worked on two levels at once because they were ambivalent and they found a way to express their ambivalence. It's not so different from the questions that Rabbi Hillel asks in the Mishnah. Uh, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? And if I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? So while resenting the manipulation of the human rights system to excoriate Israel, many Jews continue working for a fairer and more e effective human rights system. These activists do so because they believe it is better to struggle for human rights than to revert to a world of unlimited state power. Because they carry deep memories and have witnessed recent instances of Jewish suffering because they seek to answer their tradition's call for universal justice, because they hope to strengthen Israel's democracy, and because they believe that genocide should never be permitted to happen ever again. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Galshinsky, for showing us the diverse approaches of Jewish human rights work with the particular difference uh, or tensions between Jews living inside and outside of Israel as a majority or as a minority, and the acute role of Jews in criticizing a state that was created to protect them but fails to protect others it rules. And so the problematic and protective, productive tensions you have raised regarding international law, national Israeli law, and Jewish law will surely resonate with a lot with all of us for the rest of tonight and hopefully beyond. So let us continue this conversation by bringing in Professor Mashoud Badarina. He is a professor of law at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, at the University of London. Professor Badarin um, did his undergraduate, the LLB, in Sokoto, Nigeria, and is also barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of Nigeria and then transferred to Nottingham, UK, where he did his LLM, the Masters of Law, and the PhD, and is, uh, next to being professor, is also fellow of the Higher Education Academy. He's one of the champions in authoring books and countless articles on Islamic law and theory and practice, with a particular focus on the interaction between international law, human rights, and Islamic law in Muslim states. And so if you read on international law and Islamic law, you're very well advised to read any, anything that Professor Badarin has written. Um, among the most recent ones uh, are Islamic law and international protection of minority rights in context or an analysis of the relationship between Sharia and secular democracy and the compatibility of Islamic law with the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, but his insights are not only academic. Professor Badarin was appointed uh, as independent expert on the situation of human rights in the Sudan by the UN Human Rights Council at its 19th session on, in March 2012. So please join me in welcoming Professor Badarin tonight. Um, thank you very much for <clears throat> that very generous uh, introduction. I want to reiterate uh, Michael's point uh, by thanking the Jewish Museum, this academy, for inviting us. I, I think this is really a very good means of sort of, I mean, creating understanding between communities and also creating a good world for every one of us from the perspective of, of human rights. My topic is similar to Michael's, but I'll be looking at it from an Islamic perspective. Um, it's human rights treaties and how they are received, but my context will be how they are received by Muslim majority states, because when you look at human rights, if you say how they are received, the stakeholders in human rights are many. You have individuals, you have I mean, civil society organizations, you even have multinational corporations. But since states are the major obligation bearers 
I want to see how uh, international human rights treaties have been received by uh, Muslim majority states. But from an Islamic perspective, I want to also critique it from an Islamic I mean, perspective. First, uh, perhaps we need to have what I call context and history. Uh, the context of human rights, because a lot of the time when we talk about human rights, people think human rights is at large. Context, then it's history, will also give us some sort of insight into my perspective. Now, um, human rights has three main elements. The first one is conceptualization, which relates to the fact that we believe that as human beings we have inherent dignity, which is invaluable. That is the conceptualization of it. Then the second element is standard setting. If we say we have dignity, there must be some content. We have to identify certain human rights to protect that dignity. It is not everything, it has to have content. And this is where we have treaties. Then the third element of it is implementation. If we identify those content, how do we implement them? So these are the three major elements of human rights to understand it in context. But where do they come from? Where do we, do I, I mean, do this? Uh, our perceptions come from. I argue that human rights from those three elements uh, have both old and new history, as Michael mentioned. The old history of it is that uh, it goes back to natural law, which itself emerges from natural rights. Natural rights itself traditionally is based on religion. It is only around the 18th century that natural rights became a rationality. It was based in religion. And you find out that um, uh, when we talk about natural rights being based on religion, it's very important to understand this so that, I mean, we are able to engage with the fact of whether human rights and religion are, are, are interrelated or they can live together. Now, um, Cranston argues that he uses a clay written around, I mean, 400 BC, Antigone. I mean, many of us who have read literature might be able to, to, to appreciate this. Now, uh, Antigone is a play whereby uh, Sophocles, you find out that, I mean, disobeyed the king, Creon, of all thieves in the context that uh, her brother, who has been con was killed in the field and was considered to be a traitor by the king. And the king argued that the brother should not be buried. He should be left in the open for the vultures and the dogs to eat up. But Antigone brought out a natural rights argument indicating that every dead person has a right to be buried. And this right cannot actually also be defeated by the order of the king. And she argued that this is in the unwritten laws of heaven. You know, she, she says this is in the unwritten laws of heaven that everybody must be buried. Now, if you look at it from that point of view, it's a natural rights argument. And therefore, one could argue that from a natural rights perspective, I mean, uh, religion and human rights are not really, I mean, contradictory of one another generally. And therefore, you find that both Christian, Jewish, and Islamic perspectives, adherents will normally refer, using an, a natural rights perspective, to point to their scriptures to find evidence for, uh, 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 for, for human rights in that regard. Now, from an Islamic perspective, the general starting point in relation to conceptualization about human dignity is usually to the Quran. The Quran is the divine, similar to the Bible or the Torah, as I mean, People, I mean, usually will refer to Quran chapter 17, verse 70, which specifically states, God states that he has bestowed inherent dignity on the uh, um, uh, uh, children of Adam, that is on all human beings, you know. He says specifically, and surely we have bestowed dignity on the offspring of Adam and elevated them on the land and sea and provided them for all good things and made them to excel above most of our creation. So you find out that the Quran mentions specifically that, I mean, human beings are created with dignity. And this is usually where the conception of human rights, I mean, uh, in Islam does, I mean, uh, start from. Now, if you look at also issues of standard setting and implementation, uh, Islamic history points to the fact that, I mean, the prophet Muhammad, who is the prophet of Islam, 
even before he was called to prophethood, as a young man, he participated in an alliance called Hilful Fudul, that is an alliance of the virtues, in pre-Islamic Mecca, which the alliance proclaimed that they will provide justice, equality, and help the oppressed of the land, you know, without discrimination of race, gender, and things like that. And when the prophet, after some years, became a prophet, he sanctioned it indicating that that alliance was good, that even if he was invited after he became prophet, he would still join that. So you are able to see that from, I mean, Islamic historical perspectives, from a, I mean, a natural rights perspective, one could argue that uh, um, uh, human rights can be identified from within Islam. On the other hand, the new history of it, I mean, as Michael mentioned, started with the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 by the UN General Assembly. Now, I mean, the UDHR provides a framework of what human rights are expected to be, and after that, many uh, uh, binding covenants and treaties have been adopted, which many states have adopted, including Muslim majority states, who actually have in their constitutions that uh, Islamic law is the law of the country. Now, going back a little bit, I mean, to lay the foundation again, if you look at, I mean, the natural rights perspective, most writers who trace the history of human rights to natural rights identify that within natural rights, only three rights were recognized. That is right to life, right to property, and right to liberty, right to freedom. And the argument is all what we call human rights today emanates from those three rights within natural rights. If you read Islamic classical materials, classical materials like materials published by um, writings of Al-Ghazali, 10th, 11th century, Al-Mawaridi, you'll be able to see that they were writing at that point in time about the fact that the ruling authority, which we may call the state in quotes, has certain duties. They identified five duties. That is God, I mean, looking at the Quran and the, 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 uh, the uh, sources, they said every ruling authority has five duties. The first duty is protection of life. I mean, and this is where I mean, 10th century, 11th century materials, right to life, that the state has to protect life. Then right to uh, um, uh, religion, it has to protect religion. Right to family, it has to protect family. Then the intellect and then property. Usually, the classical Islamic jurists will call it, they say that this is the object and purpose of the Sharia itself. That is the object and purpose of Islam. That is these five, but a lot of people writing will say, no, this is not human rights, these are duties, as actually mentioned by Michael. And the argument usually is, yes, I mean, a lot of the time, rights and duties are not really separable. They are flip sides of the same uh, 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 thing. Now, I will then want to look at, I mean, factors that impact on the implementation of human rights. As I said earlier, after the UDHR, many I mean, treaties. I mean, today we have nine core treaties. If you look at them, all of these nine core treaties, Muslim majority countries have ratified them in various ways, in various numbers. But then you find out that a lot of the time when they ratify these treaties, they do enter reservations or declaratory statements. Therefore, if you look at the factors that impact on the implementation of human rights, not only about Muslim states, but generally within international human rights uh, law, within uh, uh, state practice generally, you find out that, I mean, uh, those factors may include social norms, they may include ideologies, they may include, I mean, uh, political considerations. You know, for example, France, has entered a reservation to, I mean, Article 27, right of minorities in the ICCPR. Factually, they are minorities, but France says that, no, there are no minorities in France. I mean, so you find out that, I mean, a lot of factors. It's not only about religion, and that is how international law is. A lot of factors, it could be political consideration, it could be cultural considerations, it could be anything, and it could be religious understandings as well. Now, a careful purview, if you look at Muslim-majority countries today, You'll be able to see that, I mean, religion is part and parcel of the state and practices. And therefore, you find out that, I mean, the religious consideration, that is, Islamic religious consideration has played a very important role in relation to how they have received human rights instruments. 
And it goes back actually to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. If you read the history of the adoption of the UDHR, you'll be able to see that in 1940, before 1948, during the discussions of the draft provisions of the UDHR in the third committee of the United Nations, because normally human rights instruments are negotiated by states, they negotiate it. When the um, UDHR was being uh, negotiated, some Muslim countries, including Saudi Arabia, led by Saudi Arabia, objected to two drafts, two draft provisions. That is Article 16 and 18, right to freedom of religion and right to family life. Now, the protest of the Muslim majority country, particularly Saudi Arabia, was that because Article 18 of the UDHR extended freedom of religion to include right to change your religion. So Saudi Arabia indicated that from its understanding of Islamic law, this is in violation of Islamic principles. And I'll come to that in a minute. Now for you to be able to appreciate, Pakistan was also there in the third committee. Pakistan was also a Muslim majority country, but it disagreed with Saudi Arabia. It says, no, we don't read it that way. That actually, you know, our own religion is also uh, um, a proselytizing religion, wanting to attract people to change to come into it. So there's nothing that says people cannot change from it. So you, you begin to see, even right from that beginning, there, are diver, there were diverse interpretations of the provisions uh, of, the, of the sources of Islamic law, as Michael mentioned. Now, but after that, Saudi Arabia, although abstained, but that did not affect its position in relation to the reception of human rights treaties. You find out, as I said, many treaties were adopted after that, and many Muslim-majority countries have being parties to this. Now, a little bit of our understanding of Islamic law. Islamic law, a lot of the time, people see it as completely divine, static, and unchanging. That is a misunderstanding of it. I mean, Islamic law must be seen, or, and Islamic principles must be seen, usually divided into sources and methods. Yes, the sources are divine. That is the Quran, similar to the Bible, and the traditions, which is called the Sunnah of the Prophet. But th th that is not the law. They are the sources of the law. The law comes from interpretations of those sources. That is the method. And there are methods by which you interpret. So the law itself is usually called fiqh. That is understanding of the sources. And as Michael said, even within Islam, you can find multiple understandings of provisions of the Quran. Sometimes people critique the Quran to say that, well, it is too generic. And my argument is, well, that is actually the wisdom of God. Because if it was too tight, we would all be in trouble, especially Muslims. If it was just too tight, everything defined tightly, we'll be in trouble. So the generic nature of it actually gives the ability to be able to interpret it in various ways. And that is the flexibility. And in interpreting it, you find some following what I call a historical perspective. The Quran has been interpreted since the seventh century, you know, and these are documented in books of fiqh. There are people who continue to adapt, to, to, to stick to those interpret historical. The, the other one is what I call the evolutional, the evolutional perspective whereby, and there's a, a maxim within Islamic law that says that the interpretations or the laws, ahakam, the rulings, the laws can change based on changes in time and changes in place, in places. It's a, an established maxim of Islamic law. Therefore, if you look at the impact of Islamic norms on the implementation of human rights instruments, you will see varieties. You cannot compare, for example, you cannot compare two Muslim majority countries in their interpretation. If you take Morocco and Saudi Arabia, yes, Morocco, it's a Muslim majority country, it applies Islamic personal law. If you see their interpretations and their approaches to human rights law, and Saudi Arabia are very wide. Even both of them says they follow Islamic law. So you are able to see that, I mean, a lot of the time, these, I mean, uh, uh, impacts uh, relate to uh, uh, the interpretations and understandings. And now when we talk about interpretations for the benefit of the doubt, even human rights, human rights, there are no universal, universal interpretations of the norms for us to know. You find, if you look at the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, it's very, very different from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. As simple as the, the concept of right to life, yes, the concept is clear, but the jurisprudence of the European Court is very different from the American interpretation 
of the right to life. For example, on basic things like when does, right, when does life begin? In relation to does the fetus in the womb enjoy the right to life? The jurisprudence are different. Even though we said there's right to life, the interpretation, and that is the same thing. It's not only religion, even law. I mean, UK is a common law jurisdiction. Many common law jurisdictions in Africa exist. But you find out that in one single, in all common law, Canada is a common law jurisdiction. Many concepts of law are interpreted differently in common law UK than common law Canada. So, I mean, I'm a lawyer and that's what we do. If law is so easy to interpret, lawyers won't get work to do. That's the bread and butter of lawyers. You know, it's, it's the bread and butter of lawyers. This is what we do. That's just the point. So it's very essential for us to, human rights are not at large, similar to multiple interpretations within religious texts. Even human rights also has multiple interpretations. Now, now go on to the human rights treaties, particularly, I mean, using the ICCPR, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, because ICCPR addresses many of the contentious, because it would not be really good for me to stand up here and say everything is harmonized and things like that. If you look at the ICCPR, you find a whole lot of, I mean, contentions, some provisions in it that, I mean, have created a lot of contention uh, to Muslim states. Now, if you look over the years, um, 49, I mean, the OIC Organization of Islamic Cooperation has 56 substantive states, member states, including Palestine, making it 57. Now, out of the 56 states, 49, I mean, look, 49 of them have ratified the ICCPR. Only seven have not ratified it. So if you want to talk about reception, when we say that, I mean, generally, Muslim majority countries have received, they have re I mean, 49 out of 46 have ratified it. You know, uh, but I mean, including states that says in their constitution that Islamic law applies, countries like Afghanistan, Algeria, some of the countries you say they're extreme countries, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Egypt, Indonesia, Iran, all of them, they have ratified it. They have ratified those treaties in relation to reception. Now, but uh, in, in, as accepted by international law, Many of these countries have ratified it with uh, 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 reservations or um, declarations. Remember the point I made earlier that the impact, what the factors might not only be religious. So usually the question is raised whether those countries, most of the countries that have put in, in reservations, where their reservations motivated by Islamic law. One may not be able to say this except where the states themselves have indicated that where their reservations are, 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 are influenced by Islamic law. Now, for example, if you look at the I mean, International Convention on Eliminations of Racial Discrimination, the Convention on Racial Discrimination, all Muslim-majority countries have ratified it except two, Malaysia and um, Brunei. Only these two have not ratified the racial discrimination. It will be very, very difficult to argue that the non-ratification of the uh, uh, racial discrimination I mean, convention by Malaysia and Brunei is influenced by Islamic law. Because of the fact that you, if you look in the Quran, Quran chapter 49 verse 13 is usually referred to to indicate that Islamic sources prohibited discrimination so many centuries ago. Quran chapter 49 verse 13, for example, it says, oh mankind, we created you all from a single pair of male and female, and made you into nations and tribes, that you may know one another, not that you may despise one another. Verily, the most honorable amongst is the who is most fearful of God. So this verse is really referred to that God says he created everyone into nations and tribes so that you may know one another. So this is actually a prohibition of racism. Yet, you find out that two countries who say they have, I mean, they, um, they are Muslim majority countries have entered um, uh, reservations in their ratification. So um, perhaps, I mean, my contention is, I mean, perhaps maybe their reservation was influenced by, I mean, cultural uh, uh, consideration rather than religious. But evidently, there are a few countries that have ratified the ICCPR with reservations and they refer to Islamic, on Islamic grounds. Now, uh, countries like Algeria, Bahrain, Egypt, Kuwait, Maldives, Mauritania, you know, uh, have uh, ratified ICCPR with reservations. But most of the reservations of this country 
which they refer to Islamic law, are only three. Three reservations, three provisions out of 32 articles of the ICCPR. And the reasons, I'll quickly go through it, and I mean, I have engaged, and I critique it, actually use Islam, using Islamic sources to challenge some of the points they raise in relation to uh, 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 their reservations. But the point I'm saying is, I mean, within Islamic traditions, within Islamic sources, there are alternative interpretations, which actually depends on, depending on the political will of a state. If a state has political will, they can choose a human rights friendly interpretation of the sources in order to fulfill their obligations, rather than choosing a historical hardline interpretation that might not make them to fulfill their, their obligations in that regard. Now, Article 3, Article, if you have opportunity, if you look at the ICCPR, Article 3, Article 18, and Artic Article 23, those are the major items which those Muslim countries have entered. With. Article 3 is about equality. It talks about the fact that equality, men and women, must be treated equally in enjoying all the rights of the uh, covenant. Bahrain have entered a reservation on it. Kuwait have also entered a reservation on it. And their reservation usually is to say that they undertake to ensure the equal rights of men and women to the enjoyment of the provisions guaranteed only as long as they do not, I mean, uh, contradict uh, uh, their provisions. Because many of these countries have Islamic law as the personal law, Islamic personal law. And you find out that, I mean, uh, they tend to want to say, suggest that if uh, Islamic, as if Islamic law does not provide for um, equality in that, in that regard. Kuwait also has entered I mean, reservations, as I said. Now, um, it is important. I mean, my point is, I mean, a few countries have done so. But the point I'm trying to make, it is important to state that contemporary, most of the countries have not entered reservations to the SCCP. And contemporary Muslim scholars, including myself, continue to argue through constructive and evolutionary interpretations of Islamic sources that women are equally entitled to the rights and liberties of today's world in a similar way to men, subject only to the principles of public order and public morality as applicable both to men and women under Islamic law and international human rights treaties. And that is another thing that a lot of the time, I mean, us human rights advocates will do forget. Many of those rights, many of those I mean, peak rights, like freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and so on and so forth. If you look in the provisions, they are not absolute. They are not, none of them is absolute. Not all of them, freedom of religion is subject to public order, public morality, and the rights of others. That is, the state can restrict it by arguing public order, by arguing public morality. That is what the law says. So a lot of the time, the Muslim majority countries, when they want to restrict these rights, they don't just say, well, no, we want to restrict it. They say they are restricting it based on public order. They are restricting it based on public morality. You know, and countries like Syria in those days will talk about the fact that when Syria wants to con consider public morality, they, con we, they should be understood that Islam is part of the morality of Syria. You know, so this is the argument. They don't just do it arbitrarily. They do it smartly within the law, within the exceptions. They will not say that we don't believe in freedom of religion. They believe in it, but they say, well, but the law says, if you look at Article 18, Paragraph 3, it says that expression of freedom of religion can be limited you know, as is necessary in relation to protect public order and so on. And if you look at it, the truth of the matter is this. Public order in uh, Germany, for example, might be different from what is considered public order in Saudi Arabia. And if you look at Europe, this is why the European Court of Human Rights has what it calls uh, the doctrine of margin of appreciation. It leaves each country to determine its public order. A very long time ago, you know, when we talk about, I mean, uh, transgender rights, transgender rights, UK was very far behind from other countries. And the European court will give it the freedom, the, the uh, margin of appreciation. They say that the state is better placed to determine what goes on in society than an international institution. Uh, this is what the law says. And the Muslim majority countries use this a lot. I mean, we were talking about human rights culture earlier. Perhaps maybe if you look at it from a human rights, moral, human rights, cultural point of view, one could be arguing differently. But human rights, its implementation must be done within the law. And the Muslim majority countries try to do this. Article 18 is of freedom of religion. 
They have also, I mean, I mean Bahrain have also entered reservations in that regard, and, uh, and other, uh, other Muslim majority countries. Now, you find out that a lot of the time when there's debates in the Human Rights Committee, which is the mechanism that supervises the ICCPR, the mechanism also actually engages with the state representatives. For example, in when Algeria's report was being considered by the Human Rights Committee in, I think, 2007. A member of the Human Rights Committee noted in relation to Islamic law, and I will quote, when Algeria was saying that, well, we have a reservation in relation to manifestation of freedom of religion in Algeria, and they were following a very hard line approach. The Human Rights Committee member said, freedom of religion is defined in Article 18, as defined in Article 18, included freedom to change one's religion or faith. It was claimed that the Sharia did not permit such action, but that depended on how the Sharia was interpreted. This is what the Human Rights Committee was telling them. It depends on how you interpret it. The question of apostasy in Islam was not a doctrinal, but a socio-political issue. So a lot of the time you find out that the Human Rights Committee also will try to bring a superior argument from within the tradition to challenge the interpretation of the state. So we are talking about multiple interpretations as we mentioned earlier. Article 23 also, I mean, similar because of time. Now, a little bit of uh, uh, issue of reservations. I mean, reservations, as I said, is something that is allowed in international law, whereby a state can ratify a treaty and then put reservations or declarations against certain provisions that it is not interested to be bound by. So they follow this in order to uh, be able to, I mean, get our way around it. So when we say, Human rights generally, the treaties have been received, the reception is good, you know, but the in interpretations is usually what creates the problem, both ways, within Islamic law and also within international human rights law. Therefore, my argument, what I usually say is this. When we talk about universalization, the universalization of human rights, I break it into two sections. One, the universality, and the second, the universalism of it. The universality of human rights, I argue, is, estab is established whether you are a Muslim country, whether you are a Jewish country, because today, no country that violates human rights will come forward and say, yes, we violate it. No. No country consciously will say that, well, we because they know it's wrong. So that is the universality. The universality of it is established. But the universalism is about its interpretation. They will argue that, no, your interpretation, no, that's not the right interpretation. No, when we say, I mean, um, um, freedom of religion, no, it, could, it shouldn't go more than this, it shouldn't come more than this. So the universalism, we might get there. It is improving. It is improving, and even in Muslim-majority countries, because of the fact that, as I say, actually the reception of human rights treaties in Muslim-majority countries have challenged many traditional interpretations, many historical interpretations to the fact that in many Muslim majority countries, for example, I use Morocco as an example. I was speaking with, I mean, um, Hafsa when we were coming. I mean, Morocco is presenting itself as the shining light of evolutional interpretation in relation to, I mean, those challenges of human rights, if you look at its personal family law of 2004, they call it the model winner. It has moved a lot from traditional interpretations. Even many human rights advocates indicate, and if you look at the preamble, the king was saying that the committee, the royal committee that was drafting the Model Warner 2004, the king was telling them that, look, they should consider revolutional interpretation and also the uh, um, um, human rights obligations placed on, on, international, on, 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 on Morocco. Now, to end, even though many Muslim majority countries, as I said, you know, may not have entered reservations, on the ground, many provisions of Islamic law, particularly Islamic personal law, if the interpretation, if the states stick to the classical, traditional interpretations, certainly it creates a lot of conflict with international human rights norms. For example, in relation to rights of women, issues of equality. I mean, classic, there are many classical, it's similar. Let's say, I say, for example, when I teach human rights, I mean, say interpretations evolve. Talk, when we talk about human rights today, think about, I mean, rights of women in England 100 years ago. I mean, that's just the point. These things don't just happen once. I mean, think of even the rights here 50 years ago. So things evolve 
over time, if you stick to traditional interpretations, it will fly in the face of modern international human rights. But as I said, the sources, the Islamic sources, as I do challenge, I do challenge many Muslim majority countries. When I was doing work of um, 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 the UN work in Sudan, I engaged with them when they say, well, this is our interpretation. I said, well, you can't, yes, you are right to say this is your interpretation, but it is not the ultimate interpretation. There are alternative interpretations. So within the traditions, you know, I believe it can work because people in many Muslim majority countries, people live religion. Religion is part of their life. That is the truth of it. It is very difficult to insist that you want to promote human rights in Muslim majority countries from a secular perspective. It may not work. You need to de uh, debate it and engage them, convince them within their traditions that your tradition actually sanctions this. And you'll be able to see that doors will be, will, will be opening. Therefore, as I said, similar to what Michael said, I mean, it's usually mostly about interpretations and the political will of states, of individuals, of communities to live, I mean, uh, to adopt a human rights culture and to evolve, to make their interpretations of their religious scripts to evolve. The OIC, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, sadly, is not really doing much in that regard. It has adopted two, a couple of instruments, but many of the provisions in it still bases on the traditional interpretation. Actually, the last secretary who retired indicated that it is time to perhaps maybe, I mean, revise the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam. The Arab Charter, for example, the 1994 one was very traditional, but based on a lot of pressure, it was revised in 2004. The 2004 one, I mean, is much more, you know, evolutional. So it's not the fact that religion itself may not be an issue, whether it's Islam, whether it's, uh, it's uh, Christianity, whether it's Jew Judaism, may not be an issue. The issue is we human beings, our understanding of it. What do we want to understand from our scriptures and its impact on our lives? I hope I've been able to make some sense. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Professor Baderin, for um, a talk that carefully dissects religion and state politics and that forces us to look more closely to the potential of Islamic law. Now, allow me to pose a question to each of you before I open up uh, the floor to the audience. Now, Professor Kalshinsky, thank you for showing how Jew Jewish jurists succeeded in translating Jewish religious tradition into human rights discourse in the mid 20th century and how uh, for some, the, as you said, the selective use of that uh, Jewish religious tradition allowed them to also commit to human rights, and maybe that can be most prominently seen in the Genocide Convention. You know? Now, it becomes clear that much of that dedication to human rights comes from the centuries-long suffering as a persecuted minority. But now that Jews are a majority in the state of Israel, uh, a regional military power, how does it or does it not change from demands for protection to obligations to protect? Or maybe differently put, you, you've mentioned that commitment to religion is often at odds with commitments to a state or to nationalism or to a nationalistic ideology that privileges one people over another. And this crystallizes in the not so favorable human rights record of Israel and the lack uh, to protect Palestinians under Israeli rule. But does that mean then for Judaism um, that one would not have to necessarily rethink the relationship between religion and human rights, but maybe between religion and nationalism. Mm -hmm. Is that the question that needs to be tackled? Should I pose my question to Professor Baderin? Sure, then? sure. Professor Baderin, thank you for showing us um, how a historical perspective on Islamic law alone keeps us, or should I have... I'm just sorry. I'm just thinking. Maybe you were already about to answer, so I shouldn't stop you from doing well, that. I, I, I can go ahead. First of all, let me say thank you again. And uh, Mashud, I think we agree too much. <laughs> Do you agree? Well, uh, we'll go find areas of areas to disagree <laughs> on. Definitely, we'll call it, I believe so. So, in an effort, when we have a chance later, in an effort to increase the drama for the audience, I'll, I'll try and pose some questions on which maybe we don't agree so okay. much. That's right. Um, but to, to answer your question, um, 
you're right that the relation between religion and nationalism is as fraught, as varied in Israel as any other relationship is. But I, I, I would just point out a couple of things that I discovered in the course of my research about Israeli human rights practices. First of all, it may come as a surprise, but there really wasn't very much discussion or contention about uh, human or civil rights in, in either the Yeshuv pre-state of Israel or in the new state of Israel from 1948 to 1967. People weren't just, just weren't that worried about it. They didn't talk about it too much. Now, there were, of course, um, some on the very left wing in Israel, a kind of a fringe group, some uh, associated with Martin Buber, for example, um, who were worried about it and who were interested in a binational state. But most Israelis, Jews, did not think too much about it. Uh, why? Because they were under constant existential threat. That's how they perceived it. And so they, they, that's how they perceived it. And because they were under a, a national state of emergency from 1948 until today, that was legally and literally uh, a correct perception. They were under existential threat according to their government. So the first thing to be said is that human rights um, is not simply a matter of laws. It's a matter of perceptions. It's a matter of social and cultural life. And the, as uh, Mashud said, it's, it's a matter of how people actually live. And when people feel like they're threatened, the human rights literature shows that their support for human rights initiatives tends to go down very drastically. Um, and so there's a question about religion and, and, and nationalism, but there's also just a question about people feeling threatened uh, so that even though they are now, Israel is now a regional superpower, has won many, many wars, has a nuclear bomb, uh, has a GDP that you know, trounces its neighbor's GDP in many cases, uh, people in Israel still feel like they're under existential threat, and that contributes to their in, uh, unwillingness to change their perception from being a put-upon people to being a powerful people that's in control. Uh, and so that's the first thing to be said. Thank you. Professor Butterin, <clears throat> so thanks for showing how a historical perspective alone on Islamic law keeps us trapped in thinking that Islamic law is static and immutable, yeah. and that an evolutional perspective allows us to productively employ juristic reasoning for today's problems. And that's, as you said, that's what lawyers do all over the world with all kind of normative regimes. That's the job we are getting paid to do. So you gave the example um, that uh, the, the example of leaving the religion of Islam, ap uh, apostasy, which yep. was a major crime when Islam was still a young and fragile religion, but yep. is not considered a crime by many Muslim jurists today, as Islam is one of the main world religions that is not weakened by a member leaving Islam. So I'm just making that kind of majority-minority kind of, uh, I'm opening the majority-minority distinction up just to see that religions do depend very much on whether they are strong or weak or perceive themselves as being strong or weak. So when you elaborated on reservations that some Muslim-majority countries made, and um, you, you gave us this uh, detailed analysis, you showed that some states also use Sharia as a very convenient excuse oh, to avoid granting rights. And there's this example of uh, Kuwait refusing to grant political rights to women yep. in 1991, uh, and still substantially today, merely by saying, you know, that's what we think Sharia is meant to, uh, to, to say, you know? So it's a, a convenient, so the Sharia is a convenient excuse, you know? So this suggests that there's, um, there is no way to discuss human rights without actually very much looking into the domestic, the local place to fight through human rights in majority Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. But my question here is now, what, I, what, I, what many people seem to observe, um, do you see that there's a danger, there's this new trend of human rights, uh, of states not refusing human rights? but co-opting human rights. And you brought up the example of the Moroccan personal status law yeah. uh, when that has, in, in fact, a lot of improvements for the situation of uh, 
women mm -hmm. and children and families in general. Yep. Um, and a lot of human rights scholars worldwide celebrated the mm -hmm. new Moroccan personal status law. But hello, I mean, the last word on any of these laws has the king. So when we're talking about political and civil rights, you know, there is, there is not much improvement. As we know, if you follow the news on Morocco, and the, youth, the youth is on the street. So is there a co-optation happening here? Like, you know, the kind of window dressing saying we're doing, and the same actually goes also for Saudi Arabia. You know, now women can drive cars, but we know there are absolutely no political and civil ideas. Co-optation, is that the kind of new mode of dealing with human rights? Well, thank you. I mean, that's a very valid point. Um, my, my, um, th th there are two ways of doing things, and this also relates to human rights. A lot of the time, I mean, because we are here, particularly in, in Europe, because we are here, sometimes we feel that we just landed here. Uh, there are various ways, if you look at our own history here in Europe, you find out that, I mean, um, the good human rights record that exists, we achieved it incrementally. It has, I mean, it has been an incremental thing. And one level of incremental achievement it could be co-opting. Do, do you get the point? Co-opting, mm -hmm. accepting that, well, I mean, human rights is part of our culture, it's part of our religion, so that people can know it, can talk about it. For the fact that in Morocco, the model one now provides these rights, people talk about it in the streets, that where we have a law that says this. If somebody, something, the state might not implement it or grant it immediately, but they can talk about it. The fact that they are able to talk about it actually will spread, I mean, will make people to be conscious of their rights. I usually ask my students, as I we mentioned earlier in one discussion, that yes, human rights are not hierarchical. But if, for example, you are in a grand world and they say that, okay, choose at least one right out of all the rights in the civil and political rights, which one will you choose? People will say this and that and give reasons. My perception is, I mean, freedom of expression, you know, freedom of expression where it is allowed to exist will eventually grant all other rights. Because people will be able to talk about it, people will be able to discuss it, and people will be able to know their rights. Because people have to be able to stand up for their rights. The state will not always, that is the truth. Whether, look, in the European, we talk, we celebrate human rights, I mean, celebration in the UK. Look at the records. The one country that has the largest number of appeal cases brought to the European Court of Human Rights is the UK. With its liberal, it has the largest number decisions that have reached the Supreme Court. And people are not satisfied. No, you are not giving their right. Check the docket, the records of the European Court. You know? So all states will want to, they don't want to, no state will want to give you everything. They will put, people will have to stand up for their rights. People will need to know before they stand. I, I tell people that now, for example, maybe, I don't know Berlin very well, but in the streets of London, if you stop a 14-year-old boy, if a police officer stops a 14-year-old boy, probably the first thing he will ask the police officer is, why are you stopping me? Because, I mean, he has a perception in his mind that, well, he has to commit an offense before. In many Muslim-majority countries, and many developing countries, if a police officer stops, not a 41-year-old year man, the first thing they will say is, please, I beg you. They will not, because they will feel that, well, the policeman has the right just to arrest arbitrarily. So I think corruption is a step that makes the law not, 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 I mean, known to the people. And then incrementally, you'll find that by the time you know it, two years, three years, four years, people will start using the law to challenge the state. And then gradually, incrementally, it, it moves on. So I think, perhaps maybe it depends. I feel that, well, an incremental way is also a way. So there's uh, this linear hope for progress? Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I'm opening up the floor for your questions and your comments. Please raise your hands if. Uh, uh, whatever Professor Galshinsky and Professor Bedarin said made you think and want to pose a question. So there's one here, please, in the front. Does it work? Do you hear me? Yes. No. Yes? yes. OK. Uh, I want to ask a question to Professor Galczynski. First, I want to thank both of you and the panel for this enlightening debate. Um, 
Yeah, you said at one point that um, Israel, as all states, uh, violate human rights. It's normal, and especially if a state is under a very tight political situation, as you said, I think, um, about Israel, that has always been under a tight political situation. Um, I would like to explore a little bit what is a tight political situation that justifies or forces a state to violate human rights. Uh, and I, let me say immediately, because I think that, that um, uh, I want to be clear about my, my position on it, which is not that uh, violating human rights is justified uh, whenever it happens. Uh, no, I, I'm not describing that from a prescriptive uh, position. I'm describing it just to recognize that it's a typical situation that states that are under, uh, that have the, the, that are either under threat or have a, a high existential threat perception are more likely to violate the human rights of the people in their effective control. Um, that doesn't make it right, but, but that is what happens. That's empirically what we see when we look at states that are in states of emergency, civil wars, uh, situations of genocide, interstate wars, any of these extreme situations you're going to see a rise in human rights violations in the state. So what I meant to, to uh, argue was not that uh, it's okay that Israel is doing that when it does it, uh, but only that the, the proper response from the international system to Israel's violation of human rights is to go through the same process that it goes through with every other state, which is to uh, send special rapporteurs or investigators uh, gather evidence, try to uh, find out whether the attested violations have evidence that backs them up or not, get witness impact statements and so on, and treat it as a, a case that goes before the treaty body or a court of law like the International Criminal Court um, and, and then is adjudicated fairly uh, and impartially under law. That's not what's happened, uh, I argue with respect to Israel in many cases, that it, rather than adjudicating individual violations of policy or practice, what's happened is that Israel's enemies uh, have seized on those violations to engage in a wholesale delegitima delegitimation of the state. And that, that's not okay. Uh, can, I, can I, to this point, uh, yeah ask another little question or, or make a remark. Uh, I think it's interesting what you're saying, and I've heard this often. Doesn't it mean that Israel is being taken seriously as a state of law and also as a legitimate part of the international community that so often it's being criticized? I mean, it's not necessarily a negative. No, I, it's, take, I, it's taken I, seriously as, as I a, wish that's what it meant. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I, I don't think it is what it means it, in some cases perhaps, but um, I'll just say that that uh, it's the especially the attempts to expel Israel from the international community uh, don't strike me as trying to take Israel seriously as uh, as a state it, it, rather to as I say, uh, make it a not not a state. And that's that's a different thing. Okay, there was one more hand I saw over there. It's uh, the black um, pullover. Yeah. Then more. Yes. Uh, yes, on the same issue, uh, two points maybe. Uh, one. To, uh, Sorry. One, just to uh, maybe uh, clarify how the impression maybe arose of uh, thinking that it was justified. Um, I'm glad that you clarified that uh, that, that was not your position. Uh, your comparison to Finland to me seemed a, a bit off key because Finland obviously is currently not a country that is under existential uh, threat perception. And um, so, I, um, yeah, that was just about that point. But, um, uh, you have you pointed out the the discrepancies or the 
imbalance in the treatment of Israel on, on one side, and I don't want to minimize that. I, I agree that there are some, you know, that there is some, uh, you know, high level of hypocrisy of uh, countries like Saudi Arabia and so on. We don't have to uh, go into the details, um, focusing on this one issue, ignoring their own. But uh, you left out the other side of the discrepancy. Um, we also have the fact that nothing can get through the Security Council, even on you know, minimal violations that everyone should agree on, that should be you know, pointed out, criticized, and, uh, and sanctioned. So I think this, this situation of polarization that we have, where nothing can get through the Security Council, uh, contributes to this excess in the, in the uh, General Assembly and you know, almost uh, you know, uh, pushes each other away from the, the state that we, I think, all want, that just the rules should be applied in, a, in an impartial manner. And I think both po points need to be seen in order to improve that situation. Oh, I entirely agree with you. Um, absolutely right. Uh, the, the Security Council has been the worst, uh, a, a bad offender here too, uh, partly because Israel uh, has the protection of the United States with its veto. But I would point out that that hasn't been uniformly the case. And in particular, with respect to the settlements in the West Bank, the United States has uh, either assented or abstained on 10 security resolutions calling for the with, uh, withdrawal of Israel from the West Bank settlements. That's an unusual situation because, as you point out, it usually acts as Israel's protector. In that particular case, though, the international human rights law and the international humanitarian law are so clear, in particular the Fourth Geneva Convention and the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, uh, which declare that um, a, a country may not settle uh, members of its population voluntarily or involuntarily in a state that it occupies. The reason for that being that uh, international law does not want countries annexing their neighbors. It wants uh, to have territorial integrity of states. And this settlement policy is in manifest violation of that as the United States has assented to. So I, it's, not a blanket, it's not a blanket protection, but you're right that there's an issue there. I think there was the lady in the front. Yes. Please raise your hands if you want me to put you on the list. Um, my question is directed to Professor Badarin. Uh, First of all, thank you very much. It was really intriguing. I would like to hear your opinion about perceptions conceiving of the implementation and protection of human rights as a merely Western and external concern um, imposed on majority Muslim countries. Um, this is related uh, to something I read in one of your articles uh, where you mentioned, I think, two conferences at least one, one of them was, um, uh, took place in Nigeria, I think, where you described the re reactions of participants somehow okay. feeling yeah. like uh, the wish to implement or protect human rights as being an attack on Islamic law. And uh, so if you could say a little bit more about local actors engaging in this discourse, human rights, Islamic law, um, maybe also about actors trained themselves in Islamic law and argumenting in a religious legal way. And then, which is also di like related to the question is um, about your own expertise. So you said you are trained law like a, a lawyer, so I would just be interested in which law systems and if this includes also Islamic law, mm. in order to understand uh, how is the reception of you, uh, of, of what you say by uh, trained, like by, by people trained in Islamic law or um, who would not accept maybe an uh, argument which is not based on Islamic legal sources. So yeah, this would be... Very th th thank, thank, thank you very you. much. Um, the first point you made is an important one. I mean, I have to make clear, if you read my articles, I do not accept that human rights is a Western concept. I don't, because of the fact that I argue, I mean, when I said in my lecture, it has two stories. On the one hand, 
it has an old history, which is the natural rights, and then the new history, which is from, I mean, one could argue that the West played a very important role in the universalization, that is, the internationalization of it. But the concept of many, I disagree a lot with Donnelly, many Western universalists who argue that, well, human rights is a Western concept. I disagree with that. Uh, because it becomes really very difficult. If you consider human rights to be a Western concept, then, I mean, the argument that many uh, of uh, traditional Islamists also argue is that, well, if it's your concept, hold it, and we have our own traditions as well. It doesn't, it's like imposing it. Now, the lecture you mentioned was not, it was actually at the University of Westminster so many years ago. I was invited to give a paper, and somebody who was an Islamist came up, and when he was, he said, well, Muslims have to be very, very careful about this human rights issue because it is not our culture. It is the culture of the West. They want to impose it on us. I mean, and many, I mean, when I used to be in Sudan, and a lot of the time, until you work in the field for you to be able to appreciate, it's not only states. When you go to many Muslim majority countries, I, I, I meet representatives of states, I meet NGOs, I meet individuals in order to know what is going on. Many individuals, I have, I mean, oh, you said you are the independent expert because they see your face on the television all the time. Oh, you are telling them, they say, look, um, I know human rights, I have doubt about it. It is against my religion. Individuals that human rights is expected to protect. Uh, so I have a statement that said, and what do you do about the victims' con con um, consent? You know, those you think that are victims of human rights say, well, no, we are not violated. So, I mean, how, how do you want to deal with that in relation to if they consent? This is our life. You can't do anything about it. Therefore, my perception is, and this is why it is essential, to look at human rights as a universal concept, which exists in all traditions. You know, rather than using what I call a political legal, a top-down approach, we need to use a bottom-up. Let the people know that, well, your culture actually approves this. And if you look in the Quran and the Sunnah and the sources of Islamic law, you have so many verses that can be used to justify human rights. And that is the approach that I use. You know, rather than arguing, a lot, many Western writers argue that, say, well, human rights, we created it. And things. I, my argument don't go that way. Right from the beginning. I, I agree, and there are many, there are also many Muslim scholars, like myself, I'm a Muslim myself, do you get the point, who argue, who argue the fact that no, that is not the case, and you bring what I call a superior argument to challenge them, and you show them from their own sources that this does exist. So I don't consider it to be an imposition. Regarding my qualifications, I mean, I mean if you look at uh, the SUAS website, I'm professor of laws. My background, I have an, I mean, initially, actually before I studied law, I have a degree in Arabic and Islamic studies. Then I studied law, which is a combined law, combined common law and Islamic law. So I have the background in Islamic law. I speak Arabic. I can search the sources for myself. So it gives me opportunity to debate. This was exactly why the UN appointed me. You know, I engage with them when they break the argument. I say, no, 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 that's not the ultimate. I say, look at this probe. Uh, look at this. Look at this interpretation. And, and they believe you me. One time, the first secretary of the Minister of Justice in Sudan, when we're talking about, he said, this interpretation, don't tell it to the ordinary people. You know, <laughs> he said, this is, uh, this is what he said. He said, if you tell this, they become very difficult to govern. And I said, no. <laughs> they actually become enlightened and they become easier to govern. So it depends on, I mean, uh, perhaps how you engage with these, with, the, with these people. So, as I said, there are many Muslim scholars, and Naim, for example, I mean, and Naim Emery, for example, I mean, does similar things. Uh, Al-Hibri, Aziz, woman, Aziza, Dr. Aziza Al-Hibri, who has established an organization in America called Al-Karama, and all provisions of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they interpret it by reference to provisions of the Quran and provisions <coughs> of the Sunnah. They say, right to life, look at the Quran. Right to this, this is so they interpret it with the traditions to show that this exists within the tradition. So there are many scholars working on this. It takes time. But I mean, a lot of the time, perhaps, I mean, it's, I mean, we use what we call the insider's perspective. You know, and Naim, for example, if it were a Naim who wants to talk here, he'll first unpack to say that, well, I'm a Muslim myself, and so on and so forth, before he starts talking. To show that, I mean, I mean, there, there is 
provision within the traditions as well that uh, are appreciated. But uh, it's not easy. It's it's hard job, you know. And one thing you need to separate also, um, which is important, is you know when we talk about Islamic sources or Islamic interpretations, Islamic theology. Islamic theology is different from Islamic law. You know, theology is different from law. There are many things in Islamic theology which, I mean, the theologians will say, no, don't do it. If you do it, you know, you'll be punished. In law, it is considered a sin. If you do it, God might punish you, but in law, there's no punishment for it. So you find out that, I mean, certain things, could, for example, let, I use marriage as an example. There is, I mean, in, in, in Islamic law, classically, if a man divorces his wife, under law, he's not required to provide any reason for it, the talak. You can divorce your wife, well, I don't love her anymore, you just divorce her. But there's a tradition in which the prophet said that anybody who, fear, who believes in God and the hereafter will not divorce his wife without a reason. Lawyers say that, no, this is not law, this is theology. If you do it, you are committing a sin. <laughs> you are not violating the law. If you fulfill all the ways by which you divorce, divorce is gone through. You might done it wrongly. If you go in the hereafter, after, God may punish you. But in law here, the law, you have fulfilled all the ingredients of the law. There's divorce. So theology is different from law. In, we, a lot of the time, people mix the two together. You know, so it's important. If you see people who challenge this a lot, they are usually the theologians. You know, the theologians, I mean, rather than the legalists. Does that make sense? Thank you. There's one more question over there. Darf ich vielleicht auf Deutsch da reden? Äh, ich möchte gerne als, als erstmal vielen Dank für diese Ausführung. Äh, ich möchte Herr Dr. Bedri oder Bedreddin da sprechen. Äh, diese Trennung, also das ist die Problematische eigentlich von Recht und äh, moralisch. Und das ist jetzt auch das Problem des sogenannten Menschenrechte. Es ist nicht verbindlich. Also ich meine, äh, äh, jeder kann sagen, ich bekenne mich vor Menschenrechte, aber ich bin nicht verbindlich moralisch, das sich auch durchzusetzen, sozusagen. Und das ist die Situation der Minderheiten hier eigentlich auch. Also ich meine, äh, viele Minderheiten in den westlichen Ländern, das jetzt... Äh, muslimische oder auch äh, ethnische, äh, kommen nicht voran. Sie haben keine Rechte. Also ich sage nur Beispiel in die Bildung. Die Kinder lernen nicht über ihre Geschichte, über ihre Religion. Und dann haben sie äh, verschiedene Stolpersteine, kann man nicht jetzt durchsetzen. Und dadurch äh, finde ich, äh, dass wir trennen von moralischen, also das heißt, man verinnerlicht diese Sache und eine gewisse Verantwortung hat, das ist also nicht um nur Rechte, sondern um auch eine moralische Rechte für diese Menschen durchzusetzen. Das ist jetzt eigentlich das äh, große Thema von Menschenrechten. Also Sie können nicht jetzt sagen, Recht und Moral, das ist dann, äh, kommen wir dann zu die Unrecht wiederum. Das ist meine Meinung. Thank you very much. I mean, sorry. Do you want to go? No, go ahead. I mean, I agree. There's a problem. I mean, uh, in the West, we have had the debate as well. I mean, but the West have moved beyond that. Uh, the debate between law and morality, we have had it. But the truth is, morals are morals. You know, Jeremy Bentham, when we, you talk about natural rights, he says natural rights because he says natural rights is not law. He says it's nonsense on tilts. Because, I mean, it's just morality. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, who will enforce it? Once, uh, one other person's moral may be opposite to another person. And this is exactly why law is important. I'm not saying it's not easy. Law may not solve the whole problem. Human rights, I mean, this is why international law, they will, tell, they will say that, I mean, the sources of the law, we have what we call formal sources and material sources. Law is only the more formal source. But it comes from somewhere. The material sources are morality. We may, if we say, well, um, no, don't torture, don't do this. All these, I mean, are based on our conscience of our, our level of morals. But then, for you to be able to implement it, law has to intervene. In, in one way, I agree, it's a big issue in relation, well, to how far can you, can you divest 
morality from law. I mean, in international human rights law, people don't want to talk about morality at all based on the philosophical debate of the West. I mean, last uh, argument that, well, lawyers, especially uh, human rights lawyers, and they do it for a purpose because of the fact that, well, you have the laws indicating that, well, this is uh, this what uh, human rights is, right to life, and therefore, if you violate it, this is the consequence, you know? So there's a, 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 a standard. This is what we call standard set. There's a standard by which you want to uh, uh, violate. Uh, you want to be checked from violation. Uh, a lot of the time, the ordinary people in the streets, even including myself sometimes, you are so much distressed, arguing that, well, I mean, but this, but the truth is, uh, human rights are not at large. They are not. I mean, they are not at large. When we talk about human rights law, they are not at large. The culture of human rights is established because, I mean, if they were at large, anybody can claim anything. That's just the truth. Anybody would just claim anything. Not long ago, when they were about to, I mean, um, prohibit smoking in the public places in the UK, the BBC was going round and interviewing people. What is their views? And one person was being interviewed, what do you think about it? He said, no, the government can't do that. You know, if they do that, it violates my right to smoke. There's no human rights to smoke anywhere. I mean, that's just the truth. You know, if, if there are no limits, everything becomes just, you know, and from a lawyer's point of view, it becomes very trivial. That's just the truth. Professor Batarink, yes. can I add to that also? Yes. There's the... the the issue of the relation between morality and human rights is complicated, and, and, and it works in the other direction, too. So uh, Professor Batterin had, had mentioned the public morality and public order exceptions to human rights. Um, well, so does the uh, Islamic Morality Brigade in revolutionary Iran um, uh, justify Iran in some of its practices, or is there a bottom? How do we know uh, that what, when we've reached a substantive violation of human rights and we have to say no, the, the public morality or uh, th theology can't uh, overrule or trump the substance of a human rights law? We have to, so there's a, a balance to be achieved on the one hand, between the absolute quality of a human rights law and, on the other hand, that margin of appreciation that allows uh, each state to interpret the laws in a specific way. And that's not a, it's not an easy balance to achieve. So there are two last questions that I have on my list. Um, I'm happy to see more hands up, but for tonight it's going to be two last questions. So there was one and with the glasses. Here and then over there, so that we can have them in one row, and then uh, have the speakers have the last words. So thank. You. Oops, <coughs> is it? Okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much for the discussion and for the lectures. It's very interesting. So um, I want to refer to the question. I have the feeling that when we ter were talking about the so-called Middle East, which is of course a colonial term, uh, that <laughs> yes. powers there not only the state of Israel, but also the state of Israel and Saudi Arabia and Iran and Turkey and Syria and what have you, are more arrogant today in violating human rights. And even if it's, for example, according to the state of Israel, has also excluded entrance for a different time for rapporteurs on human rights there. But I don't say that it's only Israel. I say, yes, all the other, con uh, all many other states also have become increasingly arrogant. And so I refer to what Nahid Samur said at the beginning, the question of power. So where do you see possibilities of counter power, of civil right movements, because they are getting stronger. For example, in the United States, the Jewish Voice for Peace is a very strong, which has also now been blacklisted, is a very strong organization, maybe even after this uh, bizarre politics by Trump. So see you maybe a chance that this provocative policy uh, is um, increasing uh, nonviolent resistance or civil right uh, uh, activism to counter that with the uh, good democratic human right counterpower. Yeah, Thank, you. Pr Thank you. If you can just pass over the, the mic and then we'll have this final round. Yeah. So I have a 
It's also something I can, so maybe I give the question, mine is quite similar. Is there someone else that wanted to ask a question? Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Galczynski, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, Mr. Ballerin was often talking about interpreting and like uh, the the way you can actually like interpret Islamic law and that it's very bright and there's a lot of varieties. So first of all, I would like like to ask you, how much space for interpretation is there in Torah and in the in the duties as you described it? And uh, as a question for both of you. Um, How much space is there for like interpreting the human rights, which are not uh, like originating in in the Torah or the Quran, and like how can you actually compare those two um, like laws or like rules if if they are so different in like in means of interpretation? Okay, I'll try to answer both quickly, and then uh, Professor Batterin. So f first, to start with the recent question. Um, if you've ever seen a page of Talmud, which is Jewish law, uh, Jewish religious law, you know that in the center of the page of the Talmud is a little text from the Torah, and then surrounding it are uh, comments, is commentary from multiple voices, often from different centuries, maybe even a thousand years apart, but they're all commenting on the same text. This is uh, the space for interpretation in Jewish law. The, the, the standard comment in Talmud is, turn it, turn it, turn it, for everything is in it. And so there's this emphasis to say that in every generation, no matter the circumstance, no matter the social situation, Judaism has an answer. But what in practice that means is that Jews, in every situation, in every generation, in every circumstance, are providing new answers. So to come back to uh, Professor Batterin's idea of the evolution of law, Judaism and Jewish law make space for that. Um, the, the, the question, I, your question brought to my mind a comment from Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin just before he was assassinated, which was a comment to Yasser Arafat. And he told him, uh, that he was, he was lucky because he could operate uh, without the Supreme Court and without B'Tselem. Um, and so in a, in a certain way, it was a backhanded recognition that although things have gotten tougher for human rights advocates across the Middle East over the last 10 years or so, uh, leaders are still being nagged at and worried by and nitpicked at by human rights organizations indigenous to those countries. And it's not just in Israel. Um, but, and they're getting a lot of, and they're getting help from outside actors, which sometimes becomes rhetorically a tool for the government against those hum domestic human rights groups. For example, some Israeli human rights NGOs get their uh, funding from European donors. And this becomes problematic for them. Um, but, uh, but there's all kinds of ways in which little pieces of light, little uh, uh, and not so little, uh, coalitions of willing organizations and activists are able to create change. And it's just a question of being able to await the right time. Sometimes it's not the right time for human rights activism to succeed. But when everything comes together, uh, then it can be. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I agree with uh, what he said. Regarding the last question on um, what of uh, when there are no provisions, specific provisions in scripture for certain rights. I mean, from an Islamic point of view, I mean, when we talk about, I mean, uh, the system of law, the methods, they have rules, and they, uh, there's a primary rule Common law has the similar rule, which indicates that um, permissibility is the starting point. You know, that is, everything is permissible except what is specifically prohibited. You know, so if, for example, I mean, there is a provision in treaty law, even if you do not have a specific provision that can repeat the same thing in, the, in Islamic law, you fall back to the maxim that says that, well, the rule is permissibility, 
except you can bring a provision from the law that specifically prohibits that type of action. So permissibility allows us to bring in, I mean, all the, this is why people will tell you that the Sharia is very broad, because the starting point is permissibility. And for example, the rule is for, in Islamic law, if I'm drinking water in the cup like this, and somebody say that, no, what you are doing is un-Islamic. It is not for me to prove that what I, 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 Islam allows me to do this. He who is challenging me must bring the authority to show that Islam prohibits me from drinking from a cup. So it's well, the rule of legality, that everything is legal except what is specifically prohibited. Then the second point is this. Most human rights uh, treaties are obligations that Muslim nations sign on to. And there are provisions, if you look at Quran chapter 5, verse 1, it says, all believers fulfill all obligations. So if you take, if you sign up to an obligation, they must be able to fulfill it, except they're able to show that, well, I mean, the law prohibits them from fulfilling it. So um, I have engaged with many Muslim states, uh, many Muslim states and individuals on this point. Rule of permissibility, rule of treaty obligation. I mean, also is part of the Sharia, even if the Sharia does not specifically provide a text. Okay. So thank you so much for both of you to come fly over to Berlin and share your work and insights with us. And I saw so many more hands up, which I think is evidence that there's real genuine interest in having an extended conversation over human rights and religion. And so allow me to announce to you the next uh, upcoming event on the right to life on March 8th uh, at 7 p.m. here with Professor and Rabbi Novak from Toronto and Professor Brown from Georgetown University, Washington. And now, please allow me to uh, thank once again Professor Bedarin, Professor Galshinsky, and do join me in a big round of applause for both of them. Thank you.